We're rolling. Welcome to the House Dudes Podcast, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Jack Haas. And I'm Josh Koth. Here at House Dudes, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. So let's get into some real estate investing. Well, we got Damien Lupo on the on the call today. Damien, thanks for rejoining me here. I, we It's been probably a year since the last time we chatted and, and a lot of things have changed since then. <laughs> Yeah, Jack, they really have. There's, there's a, we're in a brave new world or a dangerous new world, or it's some type of new world, or at least it's a different version of a thing. And we're all trying to figure it out right now. So it's, it's definitely different times, interesting times, as they say in the Chinese proverb or, you know, the saying, we live in interesting times. Yeah. And, and we might get a few references of that because, you know, based on your background and the last time we talked, I understand your, your black belt. And I think your, your company is even refers to that. Um, Black Belt Real Estate, or what, what's the name again? Yeah, Black Belt Wealth is the is the teaching part of, of what we do, taking the f- martial arts principles. And I've I've got four different black belts, and so you spend twenty years doing something, it tends to become part of your DNA. And so using those principles and meshing that into finance and helping people understand mastery is uh, it's an interesting thing because ultimately it's not about what you invest in. It's it's about you investing in you being the primary, and then after that, it's it's really going out there and figuring out that thing that starts the ball rolling but even before that ball is rolling you better figure out how to hold the ball or kick the ball or something and that's the that's the training that that you find and you know who you train with right so you know i i thought you know we we chatted briefly before the the call here today but i thought maybe now would be a good time with with us slowly coming out of the pandemic and and everything that's going on right now that Maybe we should revisit a few of the of the basics, getting everybody back kind of on track. Um, the market and everything is changing, whether we like it or not. And sometimes getting back to those core skills um, might be might be a good revisit. What do you think? I think that's perfect. I think there's a there's a, a very big problem right now because I think a lot of people have lost their way because they're chasing shiny objects. And I think it's a really important thing in a discussion for us to dig into this and give people a perspective so they don't end up going off a cliff or blowing off their feet with the, you know, their shiny shotgun. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's start like, you know, uh, a lot of the people that, that pick up our show and listen are newer investors. Um, in this market, where do you think they should start? I mean, I know that you, um, have kind of a system and I, I know you, you kind of want to start with the blank slate, I think is what you've re, re, what you refer to on your website. Um, where, where, where do they start? Uh, where, where do you think they should begin? Yeah, it, it's just perfect because one of the, the programs I did, and it's available if y'all want to go to, to my YouTube site, it's available for free. I made it available to a couple hour training. It was on the peak life and the P stands for purge, which is the blank slate. And this is important because what we, it, what we realize, if we think about it, that our, our present day and our future is more or less a reflection of our past unless we start wiping things off because we're like, it's like an albatross around our neck. The people in our life from 10 years ago, oftentimes are the people today and they'll be the people 10 years from now. And the, so we're going to have kind of the same life that we have had or that they have. And same with the environment we're in, the job we're doing, the skills we have, whatever it is, we have to be willing to say, okay, if I was to blank slate, if I was to wipe all this stuff off, what would I add into my life? What would I invest in? Who would I spend my time with? Uh, Mm -hmm. What food would I put in my mouth? Like, it's really interesting when we say, okay, starting from scratch, because what we tend to do is we're creatures of habit. We tend to do the same thing over and over because it's a cognitive bias towards normalcy. Like whatever we've already done, we're like, okay, well, I know that to be true. That Twinkie tastes good, even though my butt's getting really big. So we just keep doing these things almost unconsciously like zombies. And so starting off with a blank slate, we can be more conscious. And then it really starts by asking better questions. And how you do that, if you don't know what questions to ask, you find people that have, that are uh, like us, balder and grayer. And you ask them, (laughs) what do I ask? What do I need to know? (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean, you know, that, um, but that, that's an interesting approach um, because people will typically kind of look at their current situation and, and try to build from there or, um, but to kind of get to the basics, that seems like a, that seems to be a really good exercise. 
It, it's fundamentally getting down to the basics. That's what it really says. Like if you were to start from scratch, I, this came up years ago because I was moving quite frequently and trying new places, new cities and, and working on projects. And I walked into one of the houses and I said, wait, before I move all my stuff in here, what do I actually want? I've got this open space. Any day of our lives, we can choose to start there. And sometimes we just have to be willing to make some tough decisions. And I said, I actually don't want anything. So I put the stuff into storage and put the rest of the stuff, gave it away. And then literally a year later, gave the rest of the stuff in storage away. And I went and got things that I really, really enjoyed that made a lot of mm-hmm. sense. And that that's it. it's one thing with stuff. What's really tough for people is, is people. Like where you say, you know what? I don't know why this person is in my life or at this level. I'm like, why am I spending three hours a day on the phone with this person? Because I always have. But what is it? Is it really serving me? And in, in investing and, and our money, a lot of times we say, well, you know, I'm, I've got this portfolio in mutual funds or I've, I've got this rental house. And... Mm-hmm. I have it and I guess I'll keep having it because I'm not really sure what else I would do. The question is, here's, here's a great way, Jack, to look at, like, say you, let's say you have um, a rental house and you've got mm-hmm. a $50,000 in equity in it. The question to ask is not whether you should sell it or not. The question is, if that house went away and you had $50,000 in your hand, would you go buy that house right now? And if the answer is no, well, you are doing that right now. And so it's a really good way to flip the thing around so your brain can get into a, a space of making a rational decision versus staying with legacy thinking or whatever it has been will be because it's harder to to rip the band-aid off. It really allows you to be powerful in your decision making by changing the way you're looking at it by 180 degrees. Right. And you know, when you said the the shiny object syndrome earlier, you know, we're gonna potentially are we in some cases, some of our markets, we are in that right now where people are investors are seeing uh, an uptick in opportunity, right? But um, I, I have a feeling that some are are altering what they would typically buy just because it's a it's a deal, and it might not fit what they their long term goals are. This is happening all over the place because people are, are there's a FOMO there's it's this fear of missing out, and we tend to go oh that looks really good, and we see a really good pitch, and we we go after something. And, and we say, well, like I have a lot of friends and people that come up and they say, well, my market is really good. There's the real estate is really good. People are buying houses. And, you know, we also have what 40 million people that are unemployed. Mm -hmm. So there's two sides of the coin. And just because your greed gland gets all swollen, doesn't mean you you should necessarily (laughs) do something with it. It means maybe you should take a, a pause and ask better questions. And again, if you, if this is your first rodeo, like if you're like us and you're just, you know, you've gone bald because of the experiences and the scar tissue. There, there's some that's valuable. And so if you don't have that, a great thing to do is ask people, okay, what do you think about this? You've been through a couple of two, three, four cycles. What's your experience and what does it tell you about what I'm not seeing? Because I can't see that far into the future because I can't really go backwards because I've never been through it. Mm-hmm. And what, what I would say to people is be very careful and cautious because sometimes we have what's called a bear trap. And certain places, whether it's stock market or real estate, things might be looking like they're turning around some places and all that is, it's crowd mania and it's artificial stimulation. Could be that things are getting back. I don't know. I'm not that smart. But what I do know is that mobs work in mobbish ways. We've seen this with people getting all wound up and they start breaking and smashing Apple stores. It's mobs. Mm -hmm. Mobs do the same thing in economics and in finance and the markets. And so it's it's not really any different. It doesn't make sense. In the markets right now, we've got trillions of dollars being pumped in. I mean, the Federal Reserve is is buying what they call high yield bonds. These mm-hmm. are low grade high yield bonds. That's called a junk bond. That's called crappy companies that are able to borrow money and the Federal Reserve is giving them money. It doesn't make any sense. So the point of this is if you go chase what looks to be good, you're not really chasing it based on fundamentals. You're chasing it based on somebody giving heroin to a drug addict. And that's what's mm-hmm. happening in the system. So I get, we've got to be careful about that. And and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're missing out if you are hanging on for a minute, because what's going to happen is you're going to be ready when the real opportunities I think are coming down the road. I don't think we we're seeing the real opportunities yet, and you won't be stuck in a crisis management trying to fix the crap you did in 2020. You'll say, "Oh, I'm glad I didn't jump too soon. I'm actually being mindful and being rational and not like a crazy zombie." Yeah. Now that that is really good advice. The timing is everything, you know, especially in this type of downturn and that fear of missing out is is definitely something that people are going to have to rein in. So can you can we also talk a little bit about like your experience regarding um especially first-time investors 
regarding the actual price tag of some of these properties. I think they, they kind of lose sight of the, their time, their effort, some of the other costs that might be tied into this that they need to make sure is on their radar as well. Well, yeah, there's, there are a lot of costs. And one of the ones that's just totally ignored is, is the time cost. Uh, we, can, we can look at a property. I see people doing turnkey properties where they say, oh, it's easy. It's $50,000. I own a property in Indianapolis or Memphis. And they go super easy. What they don't, they don't see is when things go wrong and they have to actually fly to Indianapolis or Memphis or deal with something. And so there are other sides to this thing. Investing in business is hard. Let's just be mm -hmm. honest. It's work. It's a four letter word. It is not a freebie. It's not like you just throw money at something and it has a good pitch manual and all of a sudden you have cash flow and there's no downside and there's no problems. Mm -hmm. So there is a timing and, and here's, here's the most important thing about investing your team. It's not just you doing everything yourself. It's really the team that you, you surround yourself with who can help you think through these things. And this is like your mentor, your accountant, your attorney, and all of these people working together. If you think you're smart enough to do all your investing on your own, you've got a reckoning coming. I don't care how smart you are. And if you are super smart, like PhDs, you're definitely going to get in trouble because your ego is going to think you're smart enough to cover everything. So where, how do you fix that? You get people that are around you that will call you out on your BS and mm -hmm. say, what about this? And when, when you hire like a mentor or a coach, but I, I like mentors better because they're balder, meaning they've just been through stuff. Right. So you hire them, they give you unbiased opinions about stuff and they're not selling you anything except the truth. And it's different than going and saying, okay, financial advisor, what should I do? And they go, oh, buy more of my crap. Well, that's not going to help you get to the truth. What, what helps you get to the truth about your time investment, the risk profile? Jack, most people are looking at the upside and going, it, it's amazing. Let me tell you, when I did my deals back in 2005 and six, I had seven deals that I was working on. All the deals went bad. Within one year, they went from thought they were all going to make me a million each to they all lost me a million or more each. So I was only looking at blue skies. I wasn't really thinking other than opportunity and optimism and everything is unicorns and puppy dogs and lollipops. And then it turned into a very dark sky. Like my friend Peter Schiff says, it was like a black swan with teeth showed up on the porch and it just tore the crap out of my financial life. That's what can happen if you're only looking at the upside. You've got to look at the downside and say, is it really worth it? And sometimes the best thing you can do is absolutely nothing except investing in yourself. And I think that's a very powerful thing for a lot of people to do. Well, let's, let's go back to that then. You know, um, selecting a mentor is, is kind of daunting for some people. How, do they, how would you suggest they, they find the mentor? How would they approach them? And, and what kind of questions should they ask to see if it's a good fit? Yeah, the best thing I like to do is, is ask people for how much, I want to see how much scar tissue they have. I want to see their balance sheet and their scar tissue. And that's very unusual because most people say, well, I've got great training and I've done some good things. And I've made money and whatever I'm teaching you about. And it's like, okay, cool. But have you been to hell? And then did you go through it? You know, did you actually, did you, and are you making money in the thing that you're teaching me how to do or just in selling that thing? And like, when you think about a great example is people that sell life insurance and you know, I've got life insurance. I don't think it's, it's what people think it is. And what, what t tends to happen is people will say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Life insurance person, what should I do? And they go, you should definitely buy this. And if you actually ask the life insurance person how they have their money, like how they make their money, it's not because they're making a bunch of money returns on their life insurance that they own. It's on the commissions. Mm -hmm. So when they're saying this is a great investment vehicle, that's BS. It's the worst investment vehicle. It's just a great place to stick cash. That's really boring. Mm -hmm. So asking hard questions, it can be uncomfortable because great salespeople can, they're like politicians. Sometimes they just maneuver around, you know, there's, there's a lot of disingenuous ones or disingenuous ones in the financial industry. And so just asking people to be a little bit transparent. I mean, transparency is, is a wicked, powerful thing that mm -hmm. I think we all need more of. And if people are willing to be transparent with you, that's how you find a mentor. Somebody that'll be real with you, tell you the truth, not try to sell you something and manipulate you literally just say, I'm here to reflect back and, and ask you questions. Jack, you know the answers and so does everybody listening. If somebody will ask the right questions, we're not stupid. We don't need a guru. We need somebody to help us figure out what the questions are. Right. So let's say somebody in your market, they, they find somebody that they'd like to be their mentor. Um, how, how do they approach that person? Uh, see if, it, if they're receptive to something like that. So there's, there's a couple of things that are great. Um, my friend Hayden Crabtree, who just wrote a, a great book called Skip the Flip, and he's financially independent. He's, I think he just turned 24. 
And instead of saying, well, okay, here's what the old, the old way of doing it is you go find somebody successful and you go, how can I help you? And, and that's, that's the dumb way to do it because you're putting the pressure on them to figure out a way to, for you to help them. Mm -hmm. the, the other way to do it, and Hayden told me about this recently, he said, man, I just found somebody that was successful and I wanted to learn from, and I started doing stuff for them. I started making their life easier, taking the pain away. And, and guess what? All of a sudden I became invaluable. And then they said, I got to have you around me. Like you're very, very valuable to me. That's one way to do it. The other way is to reach out to somebody and say, I really value what you know and, and I would love your guidance and I'd like to pay for it. Can I pay for that, please? Some people will say no. I mean, for me, I say yes sometimes if somebody's really committed because I need them to pay attention and we pay attention to what we pay for. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do we pay attention to things that we're not paying for because there's no realistic exchange and it's, right. it's, it's too time consuming as a mentor. So those are the two ways that I would say you can go and, and get to almost anybody and have their help find the right mentor either ask them how much you you know i want your time and i'll pay you for it what do you, tell me what the number is and then write the check or simply start serving people and it's mm -hmm. amazing what people will do if you start doing that right so you know you mentioned being trans you know getting finding somebody that is being transparent what, what how important is it for somebody to be transparent and honest with themselves when they're thinking about you know tackling real estate investing? I don't think most people are capable of it, quite frankly. I think people lie to themselves and then they protect their story. And to say, okay, you know what? I'm a raging X or Y or Z or something is wrong with me. It takes a lot of self-work and it takes looking in the mirror and being able to stand there and just stare at yourself. Uh, the, one of the ways to do that that's really fast and effective and almost nobody wants to do it is to look at your money. Look at your checking account. Look at your calendar. I call it the three C's, your cash, mm -hmm. your credit, and your calendar. Look at those things with somebody else and just be brutally honest. Like it's really hard to have your bank statement in front of you and somebody else and say, oh, that's not mine. Like I didn't spend all that money on Amazon. I, I mean, this is, this is one of the things I do. Like one of my credit cards is just like hundreds of transactions at Amazon a month. And so I own that. I have a click problem. I get that. Mm -hmm. I like lots of little things for my kitchen. It's just a thing. Well, if that was destroying my financial life, then acknowledging the truth, people will say, oh yeah, you know what? I have an extra $2,000 a month. Yeah, the reality is you don't have $24,000 more in your bank account today than you did a year ago. So mm -hmm. what are you doing with all this money? Let's go look at your numbers. Doing that on your own, I, I have not actually found anybody that has ever done it on their own. Right. People do it when they decide it's important enough to have somebody hold them accountable. So that's where you start. What are you doing? What are your behaviors? And you can tell a lot about your values and what, what matters to you when you start looking at your money. Yeah. You know, I, I've just run into quite a few people that... Uh, they get all, they get excited, the concept of, of real estate investing. And it's like the e-myth thing, right? We, we, we really like the idea of doing something, but we're not all wired to handle the business aspects. You might be very good at sales, but you might be terrible at handling your books. And, and it's that personal inventory that I think a lot of people neglect to go through and be honest with themselves. Well, and, and, and that's true. And a lot of people would rather just stumble their way through it. And the truth is we're just not good at everything. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's nobody that's great at everything. You might be lukewarm and that's really not going to get you very far. It's kind of like saying, okay, I, I talked to a, a client yesterday and she was a client and then she wasn't a client. And I, I said, you know, I just, I don't think this is the right fit because she was all over the place. She didn't want to focus and do really good. She wanted to have a little of this and a little of that. And I said, how is that going to work? She goes, well, I'm being diversified. I'm like, you're being diversified. You're not focusing <laughs> and going deep. And she's a doctor. And so mm -hmm. in medicine, you don't have somebody working on your brain that studied 50 different things for a month each. You want somebody that studied neuroscience for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's really fascinating. If you want to have the best results, you got to be willing to dig deep into something, not spread yourself over everything. That's, that's one of the things people want to do because they're so curious. Well, great. Become curious about becoming great. That, that will change everything. Invest in houses, invest in multifamily, invest in stocks or, or cows or corn or whatever the heck you want to do. Just figure out what it is. And quite frankly, it doesn't really matter as long as you get really, really great at it. And that means having teams because you're not going to be great at every part of that one thing either. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, that, that, that kind of reminds me that when, we first, when I first started out, I mean, uh, it was like the first time that I took the took an effort and actually tried to make a plan before I really got into 
doing this thing, I would, I, I'd catch myself uh, being distracted either by working on my business card for half the day or whatever. I would work on everything but the business itself. So I actually made a list of money making activities so that we could, could stay focused. So that if I felt like I was getting sidetracked, I could rein back in and go like, okay, refer to the list. I know that sounds very elementary, but uh, that that's how basic I had to start. I don't think anybody should be ignoring what you just said. I think you should skip back 30 seconds and listen to that about 50 times because what you just said is, is the brilliance in the simplicity and the power in the simplicity where it's, it comes down to what Gary Keller talked about in his book, The One Thing. And if you haven't read that, maybe that's your next book. It's the one book you should read immediately, The One Thing, if you yeah. find yourself making business cards all day. And, and why do we do that? Because it's safe. Mm -hmm. We do it because we're not going to lose. Nobody's going to make fun of us unless we actually publish the business card. And sometimes it's better to have a goofy business card. I mean, I remember years ago, I published a business card that I thought was snappy and it was bright. And I had some language on there that I didn't even think about. Then I got in trouble with the real estate department. So I had to pay a thousand dollar fine and, and ended up uh, like literally losing my, my real estate license and gave it back because the real estate commissioner said, Oh, you, you said something about a realtor on here. And I was like, Holy cow. It was like, but I got, you know what? I said, okay, fine. And there were consequences. I, I made a mistake. I admit that it was, it's on me. It's my responsibility. And yet I kept moving forward. And what happened because I was taking action, I made millions and millions of dollars. So what are the things that matter? People, deals, and money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the fuel, the people, and the deals. And, and so if you think about that, when you're doing what you're doing, are you focusing on one of those three things? And if you're not, you're probably doing something wrong, meaning you're not doing anything that's making progress. You're on a merry-go-round, or it's like freaking Groundhog Day every time you wake up. Oh, look, more stuff I'm doing that doesn't matter. Right. No, it, it just spurred me because when you said, talk, talking about that doctor that you're referring to, it, it's kind of interesting that she had that, that problem because- most people in her profession are the really successful ones are the ones that specialize in something, you know, and, and it's like that when we're, when we're uh, talking to new investors as well, everybody's trying to do so much of everything. It's really what you focus on is what you, what grows. And if, if you're spread too thin, nothing grows. It just, it, in fact, it might become stagnant. So you got to, you kind of, kind of pick your lane, at, especially at first. And, th and that's the thing. It doesn't mean you don't do things. I always tell people my strategy is to put things in a parking lot. Something looks good. I used to have an issue going back to Amazon. I used to have an issue. I heard of a book. So what did I do? I clicked buy. Well, then I ended up with these piles of books or tons of eBooks and I wasn't reading them. And I mm -hmm. thought, why am I doing this? Because I don't want to miss out. It's like the stuff that we have in our lives that we go, oh yeah, I need to do that. And then we like jump over and we think we're multitasking. And what we're doing is just scatterbraining it. And so the, the alternative is parking lotting it, where you take these things and you put them in a parking lot and you say, okay, they have a home now. I have a thing called a wish list. We all do on Amazon, where mm -hmm. you don't buy something, you put it in your wish list. Good. It didn't die. It's not gone away. It's literally there. So I can look at it in a year and say, yep, I still want that book. I haven't lost it, but I didn't waste the money or have this big bunch of clutter. And so having a parking lot for all these things, these ideas, because there will come a time if you're focused, something grows, it expands and you say, okay, you know what? I've done really well in this one thing. I want to expand. I want to open up. I want to diversify. Well, great. So then go grab something out of your parking lot if it's still relevant or do it. But people do it way too early. They go, I've got this real estate business. I'm a landlord. I have a painting side business. I'm a Mary Kay representative. I also sell cut code knives and I work a W2 job. It's like, I'm exhausted. Oh yeah. And I'm, and I'm trading options with a, with Forex or something. And I'm going, what are you actually making money on? Well, nothing yet. Yeah. There's a reason. So what are you going to choose? Choose something. doesn't even matter. Just choose something and get really, really good at it and keep everything else in the parking lot. Yeah. No, that's a good tip. Like, you know, and in fact, I have a, uh, a little moleskin uh, tablet that I carry around in my backpack. And if I, I do exactly that, I, I, instead of dwelling on it, because if I find that if I don't write it down quick or, or put it in one note or, or something where I can park it, um, it'll recur. Like it, it takes up mental space. Like it'll, something will remind you. So I, I try to write it down where I can trust it, that, it, that it'll be there when I come back to it. But at least then when you say park it, you're parking it out of your mind a bit too. We got, we got to find a strategy around that because our mind does not want to, there's a natural tendency. Some, I tend to be very, very intense about closing loops. I don't like things to be left open. Some people 
are pathetic because they'll just say, oh, it doesn't matter. And they just don't do it. They don't finish. Those are not the people you want to have on your team or your employees or anybody. They're just terrible to have around because they leave things undone. The problem is if you need to have things done, you either get it, get stuck on it or you know you get in this loop. So having a place for it to go where it's not in your frontal lobe is a really powerful strategy. Getting it out of your mind so you can focus on the one thing, knowing that it's not lost so your brain can actually chill out. Yeah. So if you haven't figured it out already, Damien and I both would highly recommend everybody read The One Thing. Uh, that, that is an, a great book and it, it's a great reminder. So we, we touched on a lot, of, a lot of things here today, but is there, like, it sounds like, you know, we're, we're in this environment right now. We might be seeing a lot of shiny objects and a lot of opportunity. Uh, what we're both saying is, is let's be a little cautious and, and let's not jump at the first shiny object you can you see. But um, any, anything else that they should probably be aware of before uh, making those first moves, especially now? Well, here's one of the things I've, I, I do a lot of teaching with uh, people like Robert Kiyosaki and Ed Griffin and Chris Martinson, people that are very, very smart and very experienced, very gray or bald. And, and uh, <laughs> what, what, one of the things that's come up quite frequently recently is this, this idea that we're in an election year. And the amount of money that's being pumped into the system with things like, just consider this, the amount of money that's being pushed into people's their pockets from unemployment is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And so it's artificial. It's probably going to keep happening all the way through the election. And then when it stops, what happens? We've got 40 million people. And yet a lot of people I know that have apartments, nothing's changed. People are paying. Why? Because there's free money. When that stops, I don't see that going on indefinitely. When it stops, mm -hmm. we're going to have a mess. So if you think that, oh, good, everything is going to be good right now. Yeah, could be. We're in a massive election cycle. And so people don't tend to want to shake the boat, the politicians, so they put pressure on, on the, the system to keep people happy. It's like the Romans, keep them fed and, and they can watch you know, the lions eat the, the, the Christians or you know, this craziness that we do to keep people distracted. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what's happening right now. We're, we're being distracted by fake money and, and just a lot of stuff that's going on. I don't think it's the right time to say everything is, is good. Like I don't, it's not fundamentally, it's not good. You can't have 40 million people unemployed and say everything is good. The government is manipulating the system. And when they take off they, their foot off the gas, then you're going to see opportunities. It's about right. patience. And when you have patience, you can get rich. If you don't have patience, you're going to get crushed. So, well, you were talking before the, the, the call started, you were even talking about that uh, there might be some opportunities that people should just take a look at because uh, there might be money available to them now that they may not otherwise know of, uh, particularly through this CARE Act, was that? Yeah, back in, in March uh, this year, 2020, the Congress passed the CARES Act. This is the $2.2 .2 trillion spending bill that basically pushed money into all sorts of things. One of the things it did is it opened up retirement accounts so people that were impacted, and the actual language is anybody who experiences adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, fur being furloughed, or laid off, well, who didn't have that happen? Right. And so, you know, it's like, okay, so that's the definition. There's other stuff. If you had the virus and, and stuff, well, I mean, everybody basically got furloughed or quarantined in, mm -hmm. in some respect. And, and so if you had that happen, you have a couple of options. You're able to pull out up to $200,000 out of 401ks, TSPs, thrift savings plans, and half of it, you can roll over into a self-directed type of plan. You can spend it. You can borrow it and pay it back over six years, no payments this year. Like you've got all these options now, whereas that money was really stuck. And for a lot of people, that may be their lifeline. It also might be an opportunity for you to get some of that money out of Wall Street and into Main Street, like real estate, or help you, you invest in yourself with mentors or masterminds or, or seminars. There's a lot of options here. So if you want to learn about that, I, I actually wrote a report on that very thing that ties into the, all the retirement space. And you can get a copy of the report if you just want to text the word EQRP to 72,000. It'll give you on your phone what I'm talking about here. It might be a way for you to get a couple hundred thousand dollars. So if you don't do anything else, if you're like, okay, I need to, I need to buy the book. I've got this whole this parking lot in my brain. Text that one word EQRP to 72,000 and learn more about this. It's a lot of fuel and a lot of options if you can, un, you know, if you can break that money out of, out of uh, retirement jail. Great. And then I'll make sure to include the, that type of information in the show notes, as well as your website and, and a few other resources. But uh, if people 
other than the the text, is there any any other way that you'd like them to reach out if they had any other questions? Yeah, I'd love to have people come check out Financial Underdogs, uh, financialunderdogs.com. It's the podcast. It's where we're talking about you know, this the stuff you and I are talking about, and we talk about it every week. And we we get into what the, the you know the the reality of fighting the man, fighting Goliath. Um, it's it's hard. Most of us are not born on third base. Mm-hmm. You know, most of us don't have Rothschild or Trump or or um, you know Obama in the last name. We like we literally are working and struggling, and and we're we're grinding it out. And so it's financial underdogs is is where I live and do my work to help people break free of the financial bondage. And so I'd love to have people come visit. Well, I I can't thank you enough again for your time. Um, I always value our conversations. I hope we can do it more often than a year apart. Um, but uh, really appreciate your time again. Thank you for joining us and, and uh, we'll talk again soon. All right, Jack, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks. We've put a lot of effort into providing useful content and if you've found value in the show and have any interest in supporting us with a small donation, head over to patreon.com slash house dudes. And if you have any thoughts or questions, shoot us an email at info at housedudes.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at House Dudes. And if you like what you're hearing, head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps other investors out there find the show. And remember, massive positive impact requires massive positive action. We'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by housedudes.com. Do you have time to actively manage flipping and rentals yourself? If so, go for it. If you live in a market that won't cash flow or don't have the time to do all the work, are you just out of luck? If there was a way to participate more passively, would that appeal to you? I'm sure you have questions about how the process works and what to do next. If that's the case, fill out the form on housedudes.com slash investors, and we'll reach out to see if you are a good fit for our business. This is first come first serve, and we will have to stop taking applications when our goals are met. See you at housedudes.com slash investors. Tell a man what to do with his money, but if you ain't investing in property, then you're dumber than a dummy. I'm not dumb. I'm smart. Well, buy property. That's my advice.